Welcome to the beginning of ancient history on this channel. I recently did a community post where I posted a poll asking you guys what direction you wanted my channel to go into in the near future. In that poll, the UK and European history won, and in second place was ancient history. But the top comment down below was actually to do with ancient history. You guys had a bunch of recommendations for Greece and Rome. Now the video that we're going to be watching today is just kind of a really brief overview on Greece. And so to kick it off, I thought that I would would test my knowledge on the Greek alphabet and see just how much of it I actually know. Now, some of you may have heard in previous videos about me learning Latin, and I did take Latin in college or university for those of you on the other side of the pond. It was a lot of fun. I'd always wanted to learn the ancient languages, and the compliment that is Greek. So it's always been a lifelong goal of mine to learn ancient Greek, and I think I would like to go ahead and maybe start doing that. But I did teach myself the Greek alphabet a long time ago, and I don't know how much of it I actually remember. So so I am going to test my knowledge right now. We're going to play this little quiz. First up is phi. The little P ones always get me because they all kind of sound the same. But I think phi is uh, this one right here. Eta is the H actually. Delta is the triangle. Epsilon E. Iota I. Nu N. Pi. Of course, that one's easy. We all know pi from math. Upsilon is the Y, actually. There's no U. Theta, um, I remember that's the O with a little bar in it. Kappa is the K. Lambda is the A without the bar on it. Crossbar. Mu is M. Z is um, it's this one right here. Because I always associate Z with, like, Asian languages, and this one looks like a, I don't know, like an Asian, what do you call those things? Oh my gosh, the symbol, the Asian symbols. Oh my gosh, I, I know what the term is, but it's just, uh, it's escaping me right now. Beta is B. Uh, Omicron is O. Chi is the X, actually. Zeta is Z. Psi is, this one always throws me, Psi, I think it's maybe like the candelabra one looking one, oh, okay good, Alpha is A, of course that one's easy, Gamma is I think the like hangman looking one up here, yes, Omega is the horseshoe, Tau is T, Rho is P, not R, Sigma is this one right here. I never got far enough in math to actually use Sigma or Delta, but all right, 100%. Okay, that's good. That's good. At least I remember that much. So I guess it's a pretty good foundation for trying to get back into learning ancient Greek. I'll take it. I guess this begins a brand new foray into ancient history and a lot of you guys have wanted me to go back and do this first before I did any other history because it does come first. Now I'm not a complete stranger to the ancient world. When it comes to Greece, I did actually listen to all of the lectures of Yale's ancient Greek history course. So I've already had an overview of ancient Greece once before, but that was several years ago when I listened to all of those lectures. By the way, if you're interested in watching that or listening to it, I'll include the link in the description of this video for you. So I'm sure I'm going to come across a lot of things in this video that we're going to watch today that I have probably heard before. It'll be a bit of a refresher or, you know, just remind me of stuff that I've forgotten about. But I'm sure a lot of it might be brand new to me as well. But there's just something about ancient civilizations that is super fascinating. It's really, really interesting to compare them to where we are today and see a lot of the differences and also a lot of the similarities. That's what really intrigues me is learning about about the similarities of people and civilizations and cultures that lived thousands of years ago and just kind of seeing how much things have not changed in human history. But then again, also a lot has changed. So it was really fascinating for me to just see both sides of that. A lot of you have also asked me to watch some Alexander the Great as well, which I know is part of ancient Greek history. And this is also going to lead into Rome. We're going to do Rome as well along with Greece. I am going to be watching the ancient Roman 20 minutes video 
pretty soon. Now I do think I know less about ancient Rome than I do about Greece just because of that Yale course that I listened to. Now for what I have been taught, ancient Greece had like the first democracy in human history. It's not exactly, if I remember right from the Yale lectures, it wasn't exactly like democracy as we understand it today, but it was a form of democracy. And for me as an American, I do know that the founding fathers of this country were very, very well studied when it came to ancient history and ancient civilizations. And I know that they took some things from the Greeks and the Romans and implemented them into our government today. But I think the Greeks and the Romans had even more of an impact over in other countries in Europe, obviously, because that's where they're located. And you know, I know the Roman Empire did invade other countries in Europe, and I've learned even more recently about their presence in the UK. So you guys over there in Europe have a much stronger connection to these ancient civilizations than we do here in the US. Some of our stuff maybe came directly from them, but I think it's more of like an indirect connection. So anyway, that's enough rambling for now. We're just gonna take a look at ancient Greece in 18 minutes. Obviously, Obviously, 18 minutes is way too short of a time to learn really about Greece, but this is going to be a nice overview, a nice little review maybe for me. So let's go ahead and do it. We might think we already know everything about ancient Greece. The Parthenon, the 300 Spartans, and blind Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are familiar to all. Yet there were far more than 300 Spartans. The Parthenon was actually built as a kind of central bank, and no such unified state as ancient Greece with Athens as its capital ever existed. The Trojan War was as distant in time to Alexander the Great as the Vikings are to ourselves. So let's try to get our heads wow. around ancient Greece, and hopefully a little quicker than in 2,000 years. <laughs> 3,716 years ago, the pyramids of Egypt were already standing, and Babylon was the world... I just have to say that the city that I grew up in is on this map currently. Well, not the actual city, but it's named after the one that's, that's on this map. The pyramids of Egypt are already standing, and Babylon was the world's first megapolis, home to a prototype of the Tower of Babel. On Crete, however, a mysterious civilization was flourishing. It had three-storied palaces, and all this with no defenses. The Cretans apparently led a relatively peaceful life, admiring flowers, blue monkeys, and beautiful women, walked around topless, while the men preferred loincloths or skirts. The Cretans had a navy and their own writing system, and nobody has yet succeeded in deciphering them. Until one day, on the island of Thera, the modern-day wedding paradise of Santorini, all this ended in the greatest volcanic eruption in European history. Part of Thera sank beneath the waves, presumably giving rise to the myth of Atlantis. Tsunamis 100 meters oh, high really? and vast ash clouds stretching for thousands of miles around. Crete never recovered from this eruption and invaders soon swarmed in. The once peaceful island then filled with bronze weapons and tablets written in a new strange language which turned out to be the earliest known form of Greek, spoken by warlike tribes, which had settled the nearby Greek mainland, building such cities as Thebes, Athens, Mycenae and Pylos. But these cities already sheltered behind six meter walls, life here was not peaceful at all. A few centuries later, the Greeks themselves explained them with legends of Cyclopean builders and were no longer aware that any other civilization had come before them on Crete. Huh. By this logic, even the half bull Minotaur was half Greek. No. Wait, what did that say? By we this didn't... logic. We didn't conquer it, but made it ourselves. Hmm. Even the half bull Minotaur was half Greek. Nobody batted an eyelid at the fact that games with bulls were a purely Cretan form of entertainment. Greeks appropriated everything they met on their way with great virtuosity. In conquering Crete, they had conquered the seas. Marine trade saw them grow even richer. Almost all the inscriptions found among the heaps of gold in the tombs of Mycenae are financial accounts. Mycenae took the lead in the fight against Troy and Homer's Iliad. 
As recently as 150 years ago, this story was considered a fairy tale until a millionaire and amateur archaeologist, Heinrich Schliemann, excavated Mycenae. And Troy, a replica of the legendary Trojan horse, now stands here. Archaeologists have indeed found traces of fire and destructions at Troy, but this was accompanied by the decline of virtually all regional settlements. Unceasing attacks by barbarian tribes turned the whole Mediterranean into a war zone. Okay, I feel like this is going at light speed here. He's just going through all of this are really, really fast. There's a lot of stuff that I do remember from the Yale courses that, they, I mean, they parked on this era of Greek history for a few lectures. So I feel like I'm waiting to hear about some of that stuff, but he's just kind of like skipping over all of it. Yeah, and I think like the Iliad and um, the Odyssey, well, the Iliad, I think is more controversial of whether or not like the Trojan War happened. I have read both of them before and I prefer the Iliad actually to the Odyssey. I know most people like the Odyssey better, but I enjoy the Iliad way more than the Odyssey. Maybe because it has more to do with like the military and the Odyssey is more just like these, I don't know, sound, feels like mythical adventures that happen. It's a little less grounded in reality, I feel like. So I just really, really enjoy the, the Iliad though. The next 400 years were a dark age. Literacy fell into oblivion, leaving us with this. nothing to read about the events then taking place. Fortunately, what we do have is Homer. Everybody has heard about the blind poet, the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. In actual fact, we don't know what Homer looked like or when he lived, whether he was one man or many. But even though the Iliad and Odyssey were written down after the Dark Ages, the daily routines of its characters take us right back to this time. Odysseus, for instance, was only king by virtue of his larger flocks of pigs and goats. His father slept on the ground in ashes with his slaves. Homer's characters were illiterate and used heads of cattle in place of money, a far cry from Crete and Mycenae with their three-story palaces. What had happened? The Mycenaean civilization was destroyed by the Dorians, who, though Greek, were totally savage. The yeah, earlier population too. either hid in the mountains or fled to the east. Of all the achievements of the previous civilization, the Dorians left only the essentials, the sailing ship and the potter's wheel. It took a further four centuries for them to start adding the most primitive depictions of animals and people. At around the same time, the turn of the 9th and 8th centuries BC, the Greeks in Ionia borrowed a completely new alphabet from their Phoenician neighbors. This bore little resemblance to the linear writing styles of Crete and Mycenae. Do you recognize the modern Greek letters? The fog of dark ages had started to clear. Of course I recognize that, we just did that. Only here do we begin to recognize ancient Greece the country that never actually existed. This was no state with an established border or capital, but rather a multitude of distinct like and completely state, right? independent cities, polices. Yeah. How did this come about? Greece is a land divided by sea and mountains into separate little parts of which only a handful was suitable for agriculture. Even grain had to be imported, but why not grow it yourself over there across the sea? Thus the great colonization began. If the first historians are to be believed, Miletus alone founded 90 colonies. The heel of the Italian boot was colonized too, followed by the alphabet that would form the basis for Latin and take over the world. Greek civilization. Why is this giving me like British Empire vibes? <laughs> Because he was talking about the sea trade and how they got, you know, really rich off of the sea trade. And then he's talking about colonization here and how they're just, I don't know, it just, it just reminds me of the, the British Empire. Well, probably just any empire really throughout history. But I think it's the sea trade thing is the thing that um, stuck out to me as like, oh, it's kind of like the British Empire, you know, thousands of years later. Form the basis for Latin and take over the world. Greek civilization spread from the modern-day Rostov-on-Don to Marseille, laying the foundations of the French wine industry. Fragments of amphorae scattered from Gibraltar to Georgia. These were containers for grain and wine. The latter was diluted with water in proportions of one to three. Only barbarians would drink it neatly. For trading purposes, coins appeared. Like the alphabet, these too were borrowed from their neighbors.
According to Plato, a few centuries saw the Greeks settled around the Mediterranean like frogs around a pond. And yet, two cities, Athens and Sparta, almost did not participate in colonization. The Spartans descended from the warlike Dorians that had destroyed the Mycenaean civilization. They solved the land issue by conquering their neighbors in the broad, fertile region of Mycenae. The locals were declared helots, something midway between slaves and serfs, and greatly outnumbered the Spartans proper. Sparta transformed from an ordinary polis into a military camp, whose main task was the prevention of any uprising. Things were quite different in Athens. Land hunger there had forced the aristocracy and the people to come to terms. And from this, democracy was born. But first, the tyrants took power. A Greek tyrant did not necessarily terrorize people, rather the opposite. Typically, he was an aristocrat who had quarreled with his peers, holding out promises of a better life. He used the common people's support to seize power by force. From then on, all his energies were focused on retaining power. The tyrant therefore made no reforms and simply drove any rival aristocrats from the polis. To divert the attention of the populace, tyrants introduced and fostered new festivals and cults. The dissatisfied could perish in the brazen bull. But you can't roast everyone. The tyrants were overthrown, and the suppressed aristocracy attempted to negotiate with the people, giving birth to Greek democracy. If an ancient Greek were to see modern democracy, he would just say one word, oligarchy. Ancient democracy was direct, with no representatives. If a polis had 6,000 citizens, they could all freely participate in the assembly. Admittedly, the number of citizens was less than a quarter of all residents, excluding slaves, women, and the migrant workers called metics. Yeah, all of this was coming back By the middle now. of the 6th century, the Ionian cities were most advanced, eclipsing Athens and Sparta. They were the first to master such eastern innovations as the alphabet, coinage, mathematics, naval fleets, and complex trade logistics. Meanwhile, a sudden threat appeared to their rear, the vast Persian Empire. Miletus still hoped to preserve its independence, and with Athenian aid, attempted to resist. Unfortunately, this was in vain, and the Persians torched the city and pressed on. Their attempts to subdue Greece lasted 20 years. We owe our knowledge of this to the first historian, Herodotus. According to his account, as many Greeks fought for the Persians as supported Athens and Sparta, how did they win? The first reason was military innovation. At the Battle of Marathon, the Greeks used the phalanx, a body of troops fighting in close formation. The Persians allegedly lost 6,400 men and the Athenians a mere 192, plus the messenger who ran the 42,192 meters to Athens to announce the victory, after which he dropped dead. The second reason was already becoming a meme. At the narrow coastal pass of Thermopylae, King Leonidas led the 300 Spartans, who held back hundreds and thousands of Persians for three days. Sure, a few thousand Greeks from other cities and their helot subjects were a big help, yet the Spartan spirit was key. Not for nothing did they live in barracks, even during times of peace. And the third reason was the fleet. Several years prior to the invasion, silver deposits had been found near Athens. This windfall might have been spent on anything, but it was decided to put it towards a construction of 200 triremes, fast and maneuverable warships with three rows of oars. Thanks to this new naval force, the Greeks broke the Persians in a decisive naval battle. A counteroffensive began. The Greeks of Sicily defeated their old rival Carthage. A scattered array of Sorry, I just gotta stop it here. He's just he's just going really fast. Um I would really be interested in learning about of course I've never studied warfare during this time. I mean I've heard of the battles, you know, in that Yale course they talked about it and how the soldiers would stand, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the shields and everything. The naval battles, I don't recall them talking about that very much. But how in the world do you have a naval battle back in these days? You just throw spears at each other? I'd be interested to know more about that. The Greeks of Sicily defeated their old rival, Carthage. A scattered array of foresters thus defended the territory in which classical Greek culture was born.
permanently defeat Persia and liberate the cities in Asia, Athens founded a maritime union. Finally, Athens had become the center of the Greek world. 150 cities agreed to make annual payments for the maintenance of a common army and navy. The treasure was kept on Delos, the sacred island of Apollo. Shortly afterwards, however, patronage was passed to Athene, motivated by greater fiscal reliability, of course. Little imagination is required to suppose which polis was chosen for her headquarters. The most elite real estate in the 5th century BC was the Parthenon. It was constructed not so much as a temple, but as a kind of central bank, housing all the allied treasury. Without these funds, the Greek classics wouldn't have existed at all. No sculpture, drama, philosophy. The strategist and orator Pericles became the head of this new financial center. He concluded a 30 years peace with Sparta, restored the Acropolis that had been sacked by the Persians, and extended fortress walls to the city harbor. This was rebuilt to a grid layout, a forerunner to New York. While the sculptor Phidias was immortalizing Greece in stone, the philosopher Anaxagoras expressed an outrageous idea that the sun was not the god Helos, but a burning body equal in size to Peloponnese. A whole great culture was created in half a century. See, this is the stuff also that I'm really, really interested in is the science and the math that all of these ancient civilizations were able to figure out back then. That's what that really intrigues me. As well, and I know that the Greeks were not the only ones that did it. I know that the, um, you know, the Egyptians and some of the more Asian cultures had a huge part in that as well. Sparta and its allies grew jealous of Athens' prosperity. A cold war had smoldered between them ever since the victory over the Persians, and things warmed up in 431 BC. The Spartans and their allies besieged impregnable Athens. Its inhabitants took cover behind the walls. The grain supply from Africa was cut off, and those shipments that made it through brought either typhus or the plague. Even Pericles himself perished. He was replaced by demagogues. Whoever promised the most was elected strategist. So Alcibiades, the unscrupulous nephew of Pericles, became the head of the Athenian armed forces. He proposed a short but victorious war. Let's pack it all in and sail for Sicily, as if the altercations with Sparta weren't enough. The fleet was ready, but something inexplicable happened the night before the voyage. All around the city, someone smashed off the most prominent parts of the Hermes statues. Alcibiades was accused okay. of provocation, but he fled to Sparta to beg political asylum. The chief strategist then proceeded to advise the enemy. The allies began to drop out one by one. Athens agreed to a humiliating peace with the condition of demolishing its defensive walls. They had targeted Hermes and the might of Athens was crushed. On the bright side, this was the heyday for Greek tragedy and comedy. Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, the three great tragedians and the comedic playwright Aristophanes created plays that are still relevant today. And yet they penned them in the full confidence that the first production would be the last, as was the way in theater at the time. Classical drama was always about current events, and while things may have been getting worse in the city, culture flourished. There was no winner in the Peloponnesian War. All Greek cities fell into decline. On the other hand, unexpected surprises would come from the Macedonians, distant relatives of the Greeks, who had always been regarded as semi-barbarians. And then even the great philosopher Aristotle went to work in Macedonia as tutor to an extremely talented boy. The boy's father was Philip II. It was he who built up the Macedonian kingdom, defeating a Greek coalition. He almost managed to unite Greece in order to fight the Persians. But Philip was killed and his son, known to us, as Alexander the Great blazed his way through Asia, broke the army of the Persian king Darius, but still refused to turn back, reaching India. Thus, a new world was born, the Hellenistic world. Greek and Eastern culture blended to form a new home, as cities by the name of Alexandria sprang up in almost every land, <laughs> though without any democracy. All officials in Asia spoke Greek, and new oriental gods became neighbors with the old Greek ones at Mount Olympus. 
Alexander was proclaimed a god himself in Egypt. Protocol obliged all to follow Eastern tradition and fall at his feet. We can only wonder at how this might have ended. Greek decrees have been found urging the spread of Buddhism, but Alexander died young. Babylon, the place of his death, had become the capital of an empire, which immediately began to crack at the seams. While the successors of Alexander warred with one another, a new ambitious power was growing in the West. In 146 BC, the Romans conquered Greece, and in 30 BC, they conquered the last stronghold of Hellenism, Egypt. But Greek culture was victorious even here. Spread by the Romans, it finally conquered the world. Romans began to read the Iliad and Odyssey in Greek, followed by the Greek New Testament, too. In 330, Emperor Constantine built a new city on the site of the old Greek colony of Byzantium. Constantinople. This was the starting point for the history of the Byzantine Empire, which extended the life of Greek culture another thousand years, leaving wow. us the weird Russian alphabet, for instance. <laughs> really? Okay, that last little tidbit he said about the Russian alphabet, I had no idea about that. I didn't know that it kind of stemmed from the Greek alphabet a little bit. Also, this video just went so fast. I had a hard time kind of following it, but we're just getting started with this. So this was, like I said, just a nice high level overview. We're going to get more in depth into these individual eras. A lot of it I did remember from the Yale course that I took, but I don't remember the Yale course going all the way through Alexander the Great. I feel like it kind of cut off right around there. So I did not learn a I don't, I don't know, like I can't remember exactly. I don't think they did. I don't think it went up to Alexander the Great. So any learning I do about Alexander the Great and what came after him would be brand new to me. I don't really know anything about the Byzantine Empire. The Persian Empire I think was in there too. I don't know a ton about them. I do have Herodotus's book on my bookshelf, actually, the histories, and I started to read it one time. It's really, really dry. It's really hard to get through. It is a goal of mine to actually read the histories and I I would love to get through it. So maybe after I finish my Napoleon book, that'll be next up on the list. I also didn't know that America got its like grid layout for its cities based on these Greek cities. But yeah, most of our cities are very, very grid based. They're very planned out. They're not like the cities in Europe where it's just kind of like chaotic. So I guess that is one thing that America directly inherited from the Greeks. So maybe the Romans did that too. I'm not sure. But watching this just got me really, really excited. There were just so many little tidbits in there that I was like, oh man, I can't wait to learn more about that. So, oh man, this is going to be so much fun to get into and just learn about these ancient civilizations. Like I said, it, they're just such a mystery because they were so long ago. It's just so much fun seeing the differences and similarities to us today and just seeing where we got a lot of our modern day stuff from. A lot of our stuff that we have today is based on things from these ancient civilizations. I can't wait to get into like the science and the math and you know all of like the Ar Aristotle and like all of his astronomy. All of Man, it's just gonna be so much fun. I hope you're looking forward to this just as much as I am. If there are any more good videos on YouTube or just anywhere on the internet. It doesn't really have to be on YouTube. I can get them from other places as well. But if there are other videos with these subjects, let me know where I can find them. A lot of you have already mentioned the Alexander the Great series. We're going to get to that. But yeah, just let me know where all of the best videos are on all of these different subjects. Roger here and I hope that you come along on this journey with us. Also, if you know a hat that you can wear, you know, for these videos, he loves wearing his hats. So for the Greek videos, let us know which one would be good. Maybe like a wreath. Before you go, make sure that you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and you can also follow me on social media if you are so inclined. I answer DMs there too if you want to get in touch with me directly. Stay tuned for more ancient history. We got a ton, ton, ton coming up. So Roger and I will see you next time.